Sometimes God puts something in front of you. And when God puts something in front of you, you got to recognize it, amen? If God puts something, you don't want to skip that. Um, but sometimes, how many of you know the devil puts something in front of you? You ever had the devil put something in front of you? You better recognize that too. You got to recognize who is putting what in front of you. Um, the things God puts in front of you are really, uh, they encourage your faith, they motivate you. Um, and it's pretty amazing. And when that happens, they keep us very hopeful in life. But when, when there's bad things put in front of us, that tends to rob our hope. It really tends to set us back. Maybe you've gone through things. You don't know why it was put in front of you. Um, don't think God puts everything in front of you. Some people think everything in life, God gave it to me. Um, the devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. Do you realize that? The devil's putting stuff in front of you. God told uh, Cain uh, right in the very beginning of the Bible origins, he said, um, he said that the devil is crouching at the door and desires to have you. So that's something that we have to go, okay, wait a second. The devil's trying to put stuff in front of me and we have to realize that. Um, but specifically when problems are in front of us or deficits or uh, disappointing things or disheartening heartening things, what tends to happen is we, we tend to absorb that load and we tend to absorb the feelings that go along with that. And sometimes that causes a lack of hope and it gets a little overwhelming. And I don't need to talk about this today because I see this happening um, all around me uh, more than I've seen before. And it's the weight, the weight of depression. Somebody say the weight of depression. Depre depression is a weight. It's a weight. And we're, I want to, to look at this today because too many people struggle with it or have struggled with it. I know I've had to deal with things. I've had seasons where you feel, has anybody had a season where the, the feeling was a little on the overwhelming side? Okay, how about more honesty in God's house? Amen. How about a little more honesty in God's house? Amen. Um, the fact is this, this may be affecting you now. It may have affected you before. It may affect you in the future. But it may be affecting somebody you know and love right now. Right now, today, somebody. And we got to check in with people because we don't know what people are carrying. We don't know what loads they're carrying. But today I want to talk about how to identify this and how to break out from this. Uh, because before clinical psychology was dealing with, uh, dealing with it and before the medical field was dealing with it, God already had a solution for it. Amen? God had a solution. And we're going to look at today a 2,800 year old solution from God on this topic. How cool is that? I think that's very cool. God's got solutions for everything. Um, in 1 Samuel 22, if you guys want to turn there or on your device, however you read your Bible, we'll also put it on the, on the screen up here. Um, but things were not going well for David. In fact, things were going very bad for David. Uh, David was taken on a load and it was overwhelming for him. He was very stressed out. Um, and he's so stressed out, he's not in a good place. He's sad, he's feeling pretty hopeless, and he's quite depressed, really, when you look at the context of what he says, what he was doing, and the Psalms that David wrote at the same part of his life. While we're reading this in 1 Samuel, remember, David was writing, some of you journal. Is anybody journal in the room? Okay, for those of you who journal, David was journaling while he was going through this. And we have the Psalms, the songs that he wrote while he was living this out in his life. And it's pretty revealing what he was going through. So he was definitely depressed. Um, and the same pattern that he went through and others in the story, the same pattern they went through back then, 2,800 years ago, is the same pattern that we go through today. And that's why this bridge is uh, the, 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 the uh, solution for us so well. So today is how to identify and how to break out and we're calling this a cave of depression because how many of you know depression is like a cave it's like a dark hole you might not have asked to go in it uh, you you weren't specifically invited in it but you find yourself in it and a cave is a great um, snapshot because in first Samuel 22 David in fact goes into a cave and he is depressed and he's not the only one in the Bible who's done it. And he's also not alone in this cave, depressed. So the passage is pretty profound in dealing with this topic. 1 Samuel 22, uh, we'll put it on the screen for you. It starts like this. It says, David left Gath and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and his father's household heard about it, they went down there, they went down to him there. All those 
who were in distress or in debt or discontented gathered around him and he became their leader about 400 men were with him wow can you guys even get a picture of this think of what's happening in this passage you probably read the Bible and you scan through stuff but I want you to really stop and look at this picture there are 400 guys somebody say 400 and all of these people all of them Bible says all of them they're in distress or they're in debt or they're discontented all 400 plus David are in a really bad place life is not going good they're not happy and all of these guys emotionally are in a problem and all of them do the same thing they all retreat they retreat to a to a cave uh, Adullam is a real place it's by it, it has been identified in Israel where the historic Adullam is I have a picture of a cave this is a historic cave of Adullam that is a cave in Adullam it may very well be the cave that they went into um, but that is in fact a cave in Adullam and, and the passage is saying that David and 400 others went into a place much like this. This probably was the entryway and it probably opened up. And you're thinking, what are you guys doing? I would just encourage to you, this is kind of what depression does. A cave of depression kind of pulls people in and they're in some dark place back in there. You guys realize that? They're just back in there in some dark place. Um, and I'm sure they didn't wake up and go, I know what I want to do this year. I want to be in the cave of Adullam and I want to stay there. They didn't say that. But that's where, in the Bible, 400 guys plus David are. Now the cave, the cave was a very real place. Saul was trying to kill David and these other men around David, they were upset and depressed and confused about society, the environment, about the government at the time, everything going on, everything going on in their culture socially, they had a fundamental problem with it and they were feeling the weight of it. Somebody say the weight. They're feeling the weight of it and they're feeling it in their head and in their heart. They're feeling the weight of all this cultural stuff. So as a result, they retreat to get away from it all and that's where they are. So that is historically what really happened in the cave. I was praying about this and I felt the Lord wants to bring some things current for us in this passage. What does the cave represent for you and I? The cave represents a similar thing for us as it did for them. It's a place we retreat to. It's a place that we pull away from and we go to uh, another place. It's a place where people go, quite frankly, when they're discouraged. And a lot of people have a place they go when they're discouraged. They have a thing they do when they're discouraged. In the Bible, we see it. David's doing it. These 400 other people are doing it. In reality, we have our own cave, so to speak. We may not identify it as a cave, but there is a thing we typically do when things get overwhelming uh, or things get depressing. And it's really a way to, of escaping. It's, it's a way to kind of check out and not deal with all that stuff. Why? Because we're trying to protect our stuff, self, and that seems a little overwhelming out there. So, so a lot of people will retreat. Uh, David did too. In fact, they made David their leader. <laughs> Out of all the depressed ones, David, you're in charge. Show us how to be depressed. You know, I mean, this is, I'm not joking. This is a, they're, they're carrying a weight. This is a heavy weight. And David's in the same place. David, you're in charge. David's in charge of 400 people. Um, <clears throat> there's a passage, <clears throat> excuse me, 1 Kings 19. There's a passage, we don't have to turn there. Elijah. Elijah was used powerfully by God, but he also was in a place where he was alone, isolated from everyone, very depressed, and do you know where he went? He went to a cave. Elijah also was isolated and ran into a cave and thought he was all alone. In fact, his prayer to God is, I'm the only one, I'm all alone, I'm all alone, nobody gets me, nobody sees me, it's just me when I'm going through, nobody knows. This is how Elijah the prophet, powerful prophet, it's how he felt, it's how David felt, it's how the 400 other guys around him felt. This is pretty powerful. Isolated, went into the cave. And our, our cave may look differently than their cave, but even if your cave looks differently, it's still a cave, amen? A cave is a cave. A cave is a cave. Some escape through busyness. If I just stay busy long enough, I'll never have to deal with it. How many of you know that's a cave? That's a cave. Workaholic. That, that's a cave. That's not dealing with 
things. Um, some escape through uh, by medicating in some way, shape, or form. Whether it's a prescription or whether it's just knocking them back or whether it's doing whatever else they're legalizing these days. Um, it, it's a way to escape. It's still escaping from the system. It's still a cave, so to speak. And some isolate, literally, just go off alone and they isolate. And they're not in community and they're not around brothers or sisters. They're not looking people in the eye that love them, that care about them, that would say, how are you doing? I'm checking in with you. Are you, are you good? Is anything going on? Can I pray for you? Because when you have brothers and sisters in your life, this is what we do. And when people isolate, it's kind of hard to connect. Um, but let me just tell you, this is really important because there's 400 voices in that cave. 400 voices in that cave. And that's a lot of negative talk, would you agree? There's 400 upset, depressed, in debt, discontented people that are depressed with everything going on in their life that have retreated. There's a lot of negative talk in that cave. And I will tell you, if you find yourself in this place, there's a lot of negative talk. And the negative talk doesn't make things better. The negative talk makes things worse. And that's why the Bible says, set your mind on these things. That's why the Bible says, take every thought captive. Because this is where this road starts to go. In this cave, there's 400 voices. And these caves are bounce, these, these words are bouncing off the walls. Could you imagine being in there with 400 people? Think about it for a second. You're in a cave with 400 people and they're all depressed. Could you imagine what that conversation sounds like? Could you imagine? And it's echoing off the walls. Because that's what's going on in this passage right here. Um, our mind ends up getting set on the wrong things. We're hearing the voices. Our heart begins to lose hope. That's what goes on. And depression begins to set in. I've got to tell you something about depression. Depression is more than just a feeling. Depression is spiritual in nature. And you need to know that. Because if you ever struggle with it and you don't take this to heart, you, you're going to miss out on the solution. Again, I'm telling you, I'm proposing to you a 2,800-year-old solution from God Almighty on the topic of depression that, that God bless clinical psychology and medication and everything the world has to offer. But I'm telling you, it predates it as God's solution. And I want to share that with you because if you leave this out, um, we may be escaping and medicating to try to not deal with even depression or sources of things. God's got some amazing source material. If you're a note taker, that's our first point this morning. I encourage you to write these down because if you're not dealing with this, you may in the future or maybe somebody in your life is. And if you want to try to help somebody out of a cave, would anybody like to help people out of the cave? I, I would hope all of us. Does anybody want to help someone out of the cave? Hopefully we do. When people are in a cave... As Abel, as Cain asked God, am I my brother's keeper? Ladies, am I, am I my sister's keeper? The, the rhetorical answer is yes. So much as it's up to us, we can't control the outcome, but yes. We love one another, we encourage one another, we fan each other into flame. If you got someone stuck in a cave, you at least got to go up to it and say, hey, I love you. This is not your future. God's got a better way. And put your hand in. We at least got to do that. Amen? So, but depression is not just a feeling. It's spiritual in nature. And the only one that wants you to stay there is the devil. The devil goes around like a roaring lion seeking to devour. The devil, the Bible says, is an accuser. The devil is a liar. So those 400 voices bouncing off the wall in that cave, the devil's like, turn it up, turn it up. Believe it, turn it up. And God's saying, uh-uh-uh, I didn't do any of that. Take every thought captive because there's a spiritual war going on right now and you need to identify the source. This is very, very true. Um, the Holy Spirit does not want you in a cave. The Holy Spirit didn't put you in a cave. This is important because the devil puts us in a cave and the devil wants us in a cave. One of the things the devil does as he goes around like a roaring lion is try to isolate. Isolate. And take people maybe out of fellowship, out of circles, out of God's community where there's love and there's encouragement and there's reinforcement um, and, 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 and kind of get them alone because just the way a, a wolf would take out a sheep, it's usually try to get them away from the pack. Um, and that's what's going on. But this cave of depression, listen, it becomes literally, since it's spiritual in nature, it becomes a spiritual stronghold. Somebody say stronghold. Stronghold. 
Um, stronghold, the Bible talks about strongholds, and a stronghold is something that somehow, some way in our life, the devil like grabbed on somewhere. Like say grabbed on to your pants or the bottom of your shoe somewhere. You know, I don't know, somehow. But, but it wasn't dealt with directly. We didn't stop and deal with it. We didn't say, God, do you see this? I don't want this. I'm going to deal with it. We just kind of like, I don't know, guess it's not that bad and I'll just, I'll just put up with it. And pretty soon, what becomes a <clears throat> foothold eventually turns into a stronghold. Where if the devil is finding a way in our life, um, we have to identify and go after it and say, uh-uh, not on my watch. That's why the Bible's got so much. I don't have time to unpack all the spiritual warfare that the Bible is offering followers of Jesus Christ to deal with these things. Um, I would say depression being spiritual in nature has to be dealt with this way. But a spiritual stronghold, it's like a prison. And there's many people that are stuck there. And I hate to say, sadly, some people have died there. Do you realize some people have died there? That's why we have to be real about it. And this has to be a keeping it real zone. Amen? Church has to be a keeping it real zone. Um, we, we have to realize this. Um, we can't stay there. And God wants to show us a way out. Now check this out in verse 3. Look where this thing goes because it gets pretty insightful. Um, from, from there in verse 3... From there, David went to Mizpah in Moab and said to the king of Moab, Would you let my father and mother come and stay with you until I learn what God will do for me? So he left them with the king of Moab and they stayed there with him as long as David was in the quote-unquote stronghold. Uh, but the prophet Gad said to David, Do not stay in the stronghold. Go into the land of Judah. So David left and went into the forest of Hereth. So the cave is actually referred to as a stronghold. Now the context back then of a stronghold was I'll be in a place where nobody can get to me because you're, you thought you were safe in the stronghold. Um, you can imagine if Saul, Saul was trying to get David uh, and you were in Saul's army and you finally came to a little dark hole in a cave where you couldn't see a thing, who's going to be the first guy in? Who's going to be the first guy in going into that cave? People will be like, I ain't going in. Why don't you go in? I'll follow you. Um, you know, they're in a stronghold and they must have had food and water and they're in a stronghold. But ironically, this reality and this weight of the depression has been in fact a stronghold, a spiritual stronghold, which the Bible refers to often in the New Testament. So the cave is a stronghold. David's in there with 400 other guys so depressed, they're all in this place. Now listen what happens when you're in this place, when you're in the stronghold. You know what we've really done? We've left the God-given place that God has for us in life. We left it. We left it. I don't know why or how or how quick or slow it happened, but we left the God-sanctioned place for us in life. And then we're over here in a cave. And again, God doesn't want that. There's only one who does want that. And it's like a prison and we can't stay there. And the cave is, listen, what else is doing? The cave, as long as they're in that cave, it's keeping them from God's calling. The whole future God has for them and everything, it's keeping them from it. They don't realize that, but they've left everything that God called them to and it's keeping them from that uh, reality. Second point is this this morning, guys. Acknowledge. Acknowledge that your cave, if you ever find yourself in this cave, acknowledge that your cave is a stronghold. It's not just a feeling, guys. It's not just a feeling. Feelings come and go. Feelings come and feelings go. Sometimes feelings even lie to us. Have you ever had your feelings lie to you? Okay. Feelings aren't true. God-given convictions are. But feelings come and go and they can change like the wind. This is a stronghold. And we've got we to gotta acknowledge it's a stronghold. Because I think when you do, I think you deal with it different. I think when you realize this is not from God. This is from the enemy, the liar. And I need to get God's framework for how to get out of this. He's talking about it 2,800 years ago before anybody came up with any modern solutions. Let me call it what it is. It's just, the Bible's calling it a stronghold. And again, physically it was, but spiritually it is as well. God doesn't ordain depression for anyone. God doesn't ordain depression. Somebody say God doesn't ordain depression. He, he's never sent, oh, I know what I'm going to do. I'm going to send somebody into depression. 
The devil loves that because he knows that we're isolated and we're, there's a paralysis. Depression is not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. It's not a fruit of the Holy Spirit. God doesn't send it. God doesn't want it. We feel the weight of things. Burdens become real. Struggles become real. Sometimes things rock our world and we're lacking hope. And then we're going a little further. And maybe believe in some other things. And we find ourselves in a deeper, deeper place. I get it. I get it. We probably all dealt with this in some way, shape, or form. Sometimes a deeper dive than others. Maybe, again, not now in your life. Maybe some other time. But it's important. So what does God do? What does God do when this happens in our life? God wants us to know his heart. When we're stuck, he wants us to know his heart. What does he do in this case when there's 400 guys in a cave in a state of depression, in this cave of Adullam? What does he do? He sends a prophet. I'm going to send one of my prophets to go tell them my heart about their situation. I think it's remarkable. He sends a heart, and, excuse me, he sends a prophet and the prophet says, do not stay in the stronghold. I want to prophesy to you this morning. If you're here in this room or our online community. If you're in a state of depression, I get it. It stinks. It doesn't feel good. You didn't ask for it. But you know what God is saying? Do not stay in the stronghold. Do not stay in your stronghold. It is a stronghold. It's not just a feeling. It's spiritual in nature. Don't stay there. And, and once you realize that, you might start to move. But if you don't realize that, you might just cope. And try to cope. And try to cope. And maybe tomorrow will be better. And try to cope. And that's a very a passive approach. When you identify what this is, or the source behind it, you're like, hold on a second. You mean to tell me the devil's trying to rip me off? Yeah. Well, what do I do? God's saying, first thing, I love you. And I love you too much to leave you where you're at. The first thing I want to say is, would you come out of that stronghold? Come out. God's calling us out of this stronghold. There's no future in the cave, guys. There is no future in the cave. Lazarus was in the cave. Everyone thought his life was over. And Jesus said, move the stone. Lazarus, come out. Come out. There's no future for you in there. Come out. And the same is true with this. <clears throat> And the same was true with Elijah when he ran and he went in a cave. God's like, what, what are you doing? Oh, well, you know, I'm the only one in the world and this and that. And, I'm, and God's like, Elijah, I love you. You're not the only one. Come out. We're, we're, we're doing this. Come out. The God, so the prophet prophesied <clears throat> and, and told him to come out. Third point is realize. Realize that God is calling you out of your cave. <clears throat> you got to realize he's calling you out of the cave. It's not just an idea or a principle. There's no future for you in the cave. The weight is real, the struggle is re real, but understand spiritual in nature and God's calling you out. That's pretty profound. Um, you matter way too much to, to God to stay in that cave. Uh, your future depends on it as well as everything he's called you to and all the people around you. Um, so their problems are real, but listen to this. Their biggest problem was probably this. With all the struggles they had, they made a choice. They did make a choice. Part of this is a choice, part of it. Some things are feeling of hopelessness, but, but part of this is choice. And with the weight of everything they had, with the struggles and the arguments and the ideas and the you know, lack of hope, with it, they, they went to the cave instead of going to the, to the king. They went to the cave instead of going to the king. The choice is ours. Struggles are real, but we can do either one. We also can go to the cave and, and check out our busyness or workaholic, whatever your cave of choice is, or, or medicate or isolate. We can do that, and, and I know that's what our feelings will tell us to do. 100%, that would be natural and normal. But you're one of the called out ones. And we're going to have to decide what we're going to do with these struggles. Are we going to cast our cares upon the Lord? Are we going to run and do our own thing and our own feelings and be reactionary? Or are we, we going to say, no, I, I'm not going to the cave anymore. I'm going to the king. But you can do one or the other. Um, so fourth point this morning is, is, is choose the king over the cave. Amen? Amen? Choose the king. The feelings are real. Yo, you're going to have stuff come up in your life and you're going to go, this is rocking my world and I'm upset and I'm this and I'm overwhelmed. I get it. I don't have an answer. This is not heaven. And this side of heaven, we're never going to have some utopian society where everything is, we're not. The, the ground, there's weeds in the ground, guys. 
there's weeds and, and, and this, is, this is part of our life. We walk it out for the glory of God and you, and you get tastes of heaven along the way. You get some beautiful tastes of heaven. But what I'm saying is along the way, um, you're going to have these struggles and you're going to have to make a choice and I am going to have to make a choice to either choose the cave or choose the king. And I'm telling you, the king is the answer. Amen? <clears throat> So what you do there is you position yourself for a fresh encounter with God. You position yourself. You can't make the encounter happen, but you can position yourself for it. Because the Bible says, draw near to me and I will draw near to you. The Bible says, seek me with all your heart and I will be found by you. God's saying, you want to meet with me? I would love to meet with you. Are you serious? Take a step. Come. Meet, meet me and I'll meet with you. God offers this throughout the Bible. Um, and you know, just tell him. Just tell him, all right, God, I'm, I've been believing this and I'm lacking hope. And be real, brutally honest. You know, some of us, we might not be as honest with God as we need to be. And I think that could be part of our struggles too. Um, if it's on your heart, on your mind, God can handle it. You know God can handle it? Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Be respectful, but say it. And when you read the Psalms, you're going to see that. In the Psalms, David's saying some stuff. I'm like, dude, I, wouldn't, I don't think I would say that if I were you. That's the way I read it. But God was okay with it. It wasn't disrespectful, but it was brutally honest. The book of Psalms is a keeping it real zone. Amen? He's just saying what he... It's not disrespectful, but he's got some struggles. And he's being real. And that's where you take them. You don't take them to the cave. You take them to the king. Um, <clears throat> another really cool thing we don't have to turn well we'll actually turn there it's amazing insight but it's we'll put it on the screen for you um, in Psalm 43 uh, the psalmist likely David in this one feels very rejected he's feeling very rejected and he's walking around almost in a state of mourning now when somebody dies there is a time to mourn <clears throat> there's a time to weep and a time to laugh, time to cry, there's a time to, to mourn. The Bible tells there's seasons for these things when we go through life and loss. But the psalmist didn't lose anybody. He's walking around depressed. He's walking around in this state of mourning. He's very sad and he's feeling pretty hopeless. In Psalm 43, again, this is 2,800 year old wisdom from God. Spirit breathed scripture dealing with the topic. And we get a peek. It's like the door cracks open and we get a peek of how this person 2,800 years, 2800 years ago breaks out. Somebody say breaks out. Because you've got to break out. You've got to learn about it. We've got to understand it. But we've got to break out. Amen? It's not just learning. It's about breaking out. And this gives us a little peek and insight on how the breakout happened. Uh, verse 5, Psalm 43, verse 5, we have for up here. Why are you downcast, O oh my soul? He's talking to himself. O oh my soul. Hey. Hey, why are you downcast? Why so disturbed within me? Put your hope in God, for I will yet praise him, my Savior and my God. When you see soul in the Bible, it's awfully, often referring to the context of the mind, will, and emotions. He's talking to himself. He's ministering to himself. He's asking himself the questions that we ask ourselves when we're carrying a big burden. Why? Why is this happening? Why me? What's going on, right? We, we can ask all these questions. He's doing the same thing. Hey, soul, heart, mind, wh where are you at? We, we've been going this way in mourning for a long time. Why are you so downcast? Downcast means instead of looking up and being hopeful, we're looking down and we're losing hope because that's what um, depression does. It keeps us from looking up and looking out. It has people looking down. It has us shutting down. It has us in a cave of disparity, so to speak. He's saying, oh, my soul, my emotions, why are you just downcast? Why are you so disturbed? Why am I so disturbed on the inside? This is someone under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit 2,800 years ago saying, why is my soul in this condition? And why am I so disturbed on the inside? And the answer suggests the solution it suggests it's a situation of hope. It suggests his hope was put in the wrong things. Somebody say wrong things. Listen, you put your hope in wrong things and plenty of wrong things will let you down. Plenty of things will let you down. People can let you down. Institutions can let you down. P policies can let you down. Uh, society can let you down. Social culture. Plenty of things can let you down. But God will never let you down. And if our hope is in the Lord, 
We're not going to be depressed because we're going to trust him and we're going to be living in the zone. But I'll be honest with you, we often, and it's kind of natural to do it, it's not weird, we expect things from others in society and we do put a hope and a trust and we find that things fall short and then people feel robbed of their hope and they find themselves because of what they went through and the setback and the lack of hope, they find them in this place. And, and, and the psalmist is like, wait a minute, I put my hope in the wrong things. That's why my soul is so downcast. It's in the wrong things. And if we are downcast and hopeless, maybe, maybe, maybe we put our hope in the wrong things. Maybe. Maybe we, maybe we misplaced our hope. Somebody say misplaced our hope. Isn't it possible? Isn't it possible to misplace our hope? Isn't it possible to put our hope in the wrong place or the wrong people or the wrong things? It's possible. And he's going, yeah, my hope must be misplaced. The solution is I got to put it back in the Lord. I got to put it back in the Lord and, and basically praise Him. Now it says something about putting your hope back and praising God. I want to suggest something. He didn't say, I feel so much better and I feel so happy and I'm overwhelmed with joy right now. And because I'm overwhelmed with joy, I want to praise the Lord. That's not what he said. He said, I am downcast and I'm disturbed and I'm not in a good place. I think my hope isn't in the right place. I'm going to put it back in the Lord and I'm going to praise Him. Well, David, don't you feel like it? And I think the Psalms would say that's not what matters. If you only praise the Lord because you feel like it, then even our praise is reactionary in nature. Do you realize that? If we only praise God because we feel, then we won't praise God because we feel. And again, our feelings change every day. And if we live by our feelings, we're called to walk by faith, not by feelings. Amen? Feelings are real, but we don't live by feelings. We live by faith. Can I get an amen? We live by faith, but the feelings are so real, they will hijack our faith. And they will have us in a cave like so many others. Um, and, and so you got to put your hope in God. Fifth point this morning is put your hope back in the Lord. Put your hope back in the Lord and start praising Him even if you don't feel like it. Even if you don't feel like it. Now that might sound counterintuitive to you, but I'll tell you, unless you've done this, you don't understand the power of it. Um, I have been in a place where I was so stuck and I'm like, everything is going terribly and I don't know why and I don't think I deserve. And, and, and I'm like, ah, this is, this is terrible. And I was in a situation and I remember encountering, uh, encountering scriptures like this about praising him no matter what. And you're like, oh, but I don't feel like doing anything right now. I certainly don't feel like praising God and being thankful, but that would be reactionary. So I tried to do this. It's kind of like a big boy step. It's a big girl step, ladies, to praise him when you don't feel like it. It is. It's big faith to do this because it's not on feelings. It's on faith and faith alone. And you start to praise him for the good things anyway and you ignore all the bad things it doesn't mean you can't ask him about them and ask him to fix them but right now you just praise him for his goodness you praise him for his provision you praise him for your help you praise him for family members you praise him for provision you just praise him just praise God and as I'm doing that the Bible talks about a, a term called breaking forth like the noonday sun it's a term where it's all overcast and it's cloudy and your life kind of feels like that. And all of a sudden, the clouds break out. And the sun comes busting through. You guys have seen that in the middle of a storm. It's a very cool thing. It's, it, it's talking about doing that in your life. To break forth like the noonday sun. Where God is like, boom, there's this new thing happening. This new season. And it happened as a result of praise. Now, we don't have time to cover this. But any of you that want to go further on this, I just want to encourage you. There's two stories in the Bible about David in a cave. Two stories. One running from Saul, literally like running, running from Saul, and one that we just read. That's the second. In the story we just read, in the story we just read, there's two Psalms also written in the Bible, and the Psalms were written songs. This is David journaling, writing songs. He wrote songs about the two times he was in the cave. Isn't that pretty profound? The two times he was in the cave, going through all this overwhelming stuff, he wrote two songs. One of those songs is Psalm 57, the other is Psalm 142. Psalm 142 says the song of David when he was crying out to God while he was in the cave. How cool is that? 
The story we just talked about, Adullam with 400 other dudes and David's their leader, that snapshot had him in such a place of a struggle that he must have found some corner in the cave where he could cry out to God, go, God, I don't get it. I don't understand it. This doesn't feel good. I don't know why this is happening. In Psalm 142, David cries out to God. And here's what he does. There's a correlation in this, and we don't have time to cover it, between him praising God and being set free from his prison. Praising God and being set free from his prison. In Psalm 142. Again, the prison, the cave, is referred to as a stronghold. Spiritually speaking. Praising God and being set free from a stronghold. That's what's going on. And what happens next after this praising God and being set free? David comes out of the cave with 400 other guys. And all of these people step into the very thing God called them to do. Everybody came out of the cave with a renewed hope. Everybody came out of the cave with a new perspective because God seemed to open their eyes and open their heart to a fresh start and a new beginning. And all 400 of them started to move forward for the glory of God. And guess what? Israel on that point started to turn around when these 400 guys came out of the cave with a renewed heart. I think that's an amazing story. The last things I would say to you guys, if, if, if you're struggling with depression in any kind of way or somebody you know does, um, and you, you're not going to maybe read this in a, clinic, a clinical psychology book or uh, in a medical journal, <clears throat> but I believe the Bible has this solution. Anybody struggling with depression, the biggest need they have in their life is faith, hope, and love. Everybody say faith, hope, and love. <clears throat> they're lacking faith. They're lacking hope. And they're lacking love. And they're stuck and pulled over. Because that's what depression does to people. Faith, hope, and love. There's only one place to get that. Faith, hope, and love. You won't get it from a self-help book. And you're not going to get it from a medication. As with all due respect to the sciences, I'm not negating those. If that's your realm, I'm not stating that at all. I'm stating that God has a 2,800-year-old solution on this. And faith, hope, and love is central to that. And God can only give it. And this comes from being with him. These are fruits of the spirit. This is what God imparts his people when we're connected to him. These are outflows. And the other thing I would say is if you're struggling with depression in any way, if you find yourself lacking faith, hope, and love, hang around others who have faith, hope, and love in their life. Because if not, you'll find yourself in a cave of a duelum like these guys with 400 other people. And I tell you what, it can get negative very quick and sometimes Negative talk breeds more negative talk, and pretty soon everyone's getting more and more negative. Um, if you're lacking faith, hope, and love, be around others who actually have faith and hope and love in their life because it's contagious. It's contagious. And when we start thinking that I need people like that in my life, I hope you guys need people like that in your life. We need to be around brothers and sisters who say, hey, I hear you, and that sounds like a real struggle. I get it. It's a real struggle. First of all, let's pray. Let's not go to the cave. Let's go to the king. I love you. And, and I feel you. And that, that's got to be terrible. I'm not disregarding it. Let's go to the king. Let's keep it real. Let's ask. Let's, let's deal with what, where's the stronghold beginning. Let's ask God to replace some of these feelings with faith. Let's, let's ask God to take some of this away and give us his faith, hope, and love. Let, let's get God's antidote to turn this thing around. Because we too need to break out of the cave and get back to what the Father's called us to. There's a whole lot of things he's called us to. And um, I, I hope this encourages you guys. I know life has a way of sending this kind of in a random wave. It's like a rogue wave comes. You ever see the ocean and there's a boat out there and all of a sudden they're doing fine. They might be out there 10 years doing things. All of a sudden a random rogue wave comes. And you're like, where did that come from? And you see videos of this 20 foot wave and you're like, what? No one signed up for that. No one asked for that wave. I kind of feel like depression can be the same thing. Everyone's going about their business. And all of a sudden, somehow this, this thing comes. And then we react to it. And we stay there a lot longer than we should. And sometimes go in a lot deeper than it could. And that's something we're like, God, with due respect to everything else, a good night's sleep doesn't fix it. Going to the gym doesn't fix it. They might help. It doesn't fix it. Some of these things aren't fixing it. God, what do I do? I think we get back to the source. I think today we looked at a 2,800-year-old solution that can renew us. So I want to close this in prayer. Would you guys stand with me? Because I want, I want them to...
to do a work in our hearts and minds today. Um, and let's ask God to do this. We, Lord, we come before you today and like David, we say, oh my soul, why are you downcast? Oh my soul, what's going on with you? Why, oh my soul, why are you in this place? And Lord, it has so much to do in scripture about trust. Even though we believe we trust in you, uh, some of these other burdens must be not fully trusted to you somehow. Uh, I just want to pray for everyone in this room and our online community. I pray for everyone in this area of hope and love and faith being restored. Because when it's gone, when it's running low, when, it's, when we're running at a deficit, we tend to be in a depressed place. And that could be a cave. And it's hard to get out of. And it can be a dark place. And, and Lord, you came to set the captives free by nature, Jesus. You came to restore hope. Uh, you, you give us a blessed hope, in fact, in Scripture. You're all about hope. Um, so I just want to pray for all of us here in this room and everyone on the online community, God, that you would begin to restore hope in a new way, um, that, that we would break forth like the noonday sun, that we would uh, break forth with a renewed spirit in Jesus' name. And whatever it is that we're believing or listening to or the feeling that's overwhelming us, we'd identify things as strongholds. Yes, they're feelings, but if they're not from you, they're from somewhere else. And some of them have way too much equity in our lives, and, and they really need to be evicted in Jesus' name. So whatever those feelings are, uh, we make a declaration, Lord, against anything that's not from you in our lives, any thoughts, any feelings, no matter how big or small they are. If they're not from you, Lord, we just kick them out. We, we, you know, there's a cancel culture. We cancel those feelings in Jesus' name. We cancel those things, even though they're real, even though they're real. If they're not from you, we, we don't want to walk with them anymore. So we make a declaration to seek the king instead of the cave. And we ask Jesus that you would heal and restore these parts of our mind and our hearts to get us back on track, Lord, and like a storm breaking forth, the noonday sun would shine and you'd give your people the hope in the future. Let them see the hope and future you have for everyone. We ask this in Jesus' name and God's people said, amen. Amen. Can we give the Lord a hand clap? Yeah. Um, you know, again, so something like this, some of you guys are like, no, Pastor B, I'm, I'm good. That's not really my thing, you know. But listen, the kingdom's not about you. <laughs> it's about everybody. It's about all God's people. You probably know somebody struggling somewhere, somehow. And you know, you gotta pick up the phone or shoot them a text or look them in the eye and say, how you really doing? Can we do that? Can we be that real? How, how are you really doing? Because uh, if not, we're just kind of letting everyone be in a cave. There's too many one another's in the Bible to ignore. And these are part of the one another's. I love you, encourage one another, fan one another into flame. And when you're down, hopefully a brother or sister next to you is going to encourage you and fan you into flame. Amen? Amen. Let's go after it, family. God bless you.